Today we have this really cool integral involving both kinds of trigonometric functions. We have the circular kind in the numerator and the hyperbolic kind in the denominator. Now, for reference purposes, I'm going to call this integral i, and notice that I'm integrating an even function of x. So I could define this as one half the integral from negative to positive infinity of the cosine of x divided by the hyperbolic cosine or the cosh of x. Okay, and a nice strategy would be to expand the cosh function here. Now cosh x equals e to the x plus e to the negative x by 2. And this implies that i equals one half the integral from negative to positive infinity because of this factor of 1 by 2 in the denominator, you can just write this as a factor of 2 for the integral. We have cosine x divided by e to the x plus e to the negative x dx. The 2's cancel out nicely, and we have the integral from negative to positive infinity of cosine x divided by e to the x plus e to the negative x dx. Okay, that was cool, but now what? Well, for the resulting integral, let's make a substitution where we let e to the x equal u, which implies that x equals log u, which further implies that dx equals 1 by u du. So this implies that i equals the integral from where to where exactly. Well, as x approaches negative infinity, u, which is e to the x, approaches 0. So the lower limit is 0, and the upper limit as x approaches infinity, u will also approach infinity. So we have the integral from 0 to infinity now of the cosine of x, which is now the logarithm of u, divided by u plus e to the negative x is 1 by u, and the differential element is now 1 by u du. And some simplification for the denominator here, we can write this as 1 plus u squared divided by u, and the reciprocals of u cancel out quite nicely. And finally, we have the structure of the integral from 0 to infinity of the cosine of log u divided by 1 plus u squared du. Now, what exactly do we mean by the cosine of log u? Well, invoking Euler's beautiful formula, where we know that e to the i x, where x is some real number, equals the cosine of x plus i times the sine of x. So this implies that the cosine of x is just the real part of e to the i x. And if we replace x by log x, we find that cosine log x equals the real part of e to the i times log x, which using the correspondence with the complex power function means that we have the real part of x to the i. So what all of this means for our integral is that the integral i equals the real part of the integral from zero to infinity of x to the i divided by one plus x squared dx. And now a tangent substitution would be pretty cool. So if we let x equal the tangent of phi, which implies that phi equals the inverse tangent of x, of course, and this further implies that d phi equals one by one plus x squared dx. So we have the requisite structure for the tangent substitution here. So this implies that i equals the real part of the integral from where to where. Well, for x to approach 0, we need phi to approach 0. And for x to approach infinity, we need, phi, we need phi to approach pi by 2. And x to the i becomes tangent to the i of phi. And we have the differential element d phi. And this is a pretty cool integral to evaluate. First up, let's expand the tangent here as the sine over cosine. So we have the real part of the integral from zero to pi by two of the sine to the i of phi times cosine to the negative i of phi d phi. And this structure here calls for a beta function, specifically the geometric representation of the beta function. So the beta function with complex arguments s and t is defined as twice the integral from zero to pi by two of sine to the two s minus one of phi times the cosine to the two t minus one of phi d phi. So on comparing the exponents for the sine and cosine terms, we see that two s minus one equals i, 
which implies that s equals 1 plus i by 2, and 2t minus 1 equals negative i, so this implies that t equals 1 minus i by 2. So what this means is our integral i is 1 half the real part of the beta function evaluated at 1 plus i by 2 and 1 minus i by 2, and invoking the relationship between the beta function and its cousin, more famous cousin, the gamma function, we have one half the real part of gamma one plus i by two times gamma one minus i by two divided by the gamma function evaluated at the sum of these arguments. So we have one plus i plus one minus i by two. The plus and minus i's cancel out. We're left with gamma two by two, gamma one, which is of course one. So this implies that i in fact equals one half the real part of gamma one plus i by two times gamma one minus i by two, i by two, which can be written as one minus one plus i by two, correct? And now we have just the structure needed for invoking Euler's wonderful reflection formula. So here we go, one of my favorite tools. We know that gamma z times gamma one minus z equals pi times the cosecant of pi z. Link in the description below for a proof. And here z equals one plus i by two. So this implies that i equals one half the real part of pi times the cosecant of pi times 1 plus i by 2, which is of course pi by 2, oh terribly sorry about that, plus i times pi by 2. And because of the phase shift of pi by 2, the cosecant turns into a secant. So we have pi by 2 times the real part of the secant of i pi by 2. Now the secant of i times some real number is the hyperbolic secant. So this implies that we can write i as pi by two times the hyperbolic secant is just a real number. So we have hyperbolic secant pi by two, which is a pretty cool result for a fitting for a pretty cool integral. And I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you, see you next time.